on this episode of Weather Watch. We examine the power that one tornado unleashed on one of Pennsylvania's largest man-made landmarks. Then we continue our countdown and reveal the number one severe weather outbreak in the Weather Watch Top 5. And finally, we take a look at what happens behind the scenes and putting together an episode of Weather Watch. All of this and more coming up on this edition of Weather Watch. Hello and welcome to Weather Watch, Millersville University's exclusive weather news program. I'm your host, Mike Yalch. Let's get you caught up on the weather that made headlines around the world over the past few weeks in this edition of your Weather in 60 Seconds. Hail in Afghanistan, freezing rain in Canada, and tornadoes in Louisiana are all in this edition of your Weather in 60 Seconds. Heading across the Atlantic Ocean into Afghanistan, where a severe thunderstorm produced heavy rain, wind, and damaging hail. This storm passed over Kandahar Airfield in southern Afghanistan, dropping golf ball-sized hail. These hailstones damaged 50 United States and Coalition helicopters and also killed three people. Heading back to North America, we will stop in Canada, where places in Ontario had a freezing rain advisory for two days. This storm brought around a half an inch of precipitation with freezing rain and winds gusting up to 50 miles an hour. As a result of the high winds and ice buildup, 150,000 people were left without power. Crossing the border into the United States, we will head south to Kenner, Louisiana, where two tornadoes touched down damaging cars, homes, and taking down trees and power lines. These two tornadoes were classified by the National Weather Service using the Enhanced Vegeta Scale. The first tornado was classified as an EF1 tornado, and the second tornado that touched down was classified as an EF0. And that will do it for this edition of your weather in 60 seconds. All season long, we've been counting down the top five severe weather outbreaks. Weather Watch's Pete Molinax is here to reveal the number one severe weather outbreak in our final installment of the Weather Watch Top Five. It's all come down to this. We have now reached the number one severe weather outbreak of all time. Although there were plenty of other destructive outbreaks, this outbreak tops our list. In late April of 2011, the single biggest tornado outbreak ever occurred from the Great Plains and stretched all the way to the East Coast. In addition to its high death toll, it was the single costliest tornado outbreak ever. At number one in our countdown is the late April outbreak of 2011. The April 25th, 28th, 2011 outbreak was the largest tornado outbreak in U.S. history. One reason why it was so destructive was because it spawned over four days. The worst of the outbreak occurred on April 27th when deadly tornadoes tracked across the southeastern United States. The Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma did a good job predicting the outbreak, issuing forecasts for the potential outbreak at least five days in advance. There were 15 EF4 and EF5 tornadoes total, with eight of the tornadoes tracking 50 miles or longer. One notable tornado tracked from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham, Alabama. After tracking just over 80 miles, this tornado claimed the lives of 64 people and injured over 1,500. The scene in Tuscaloosa was similar to other towns nearby in the southeast that were obliterated by the intense tornadoes. By the time the outbreak ended on April 28th, estimated damages reached roughly $10.2 billion, making it the single costliest tornado outbreak ever, and among the list as one of the costliest natural disasters in United States history. The outbreak claimed the lives of 324 people, just barely exceeding the death toll from the 1974 tornado super outbreak. With that said, the 2011 late April outbreak is the number one severe weather outbreak on our list. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Peter Molinax. Thanks, Pete. In a new segment here on Weather Watch, we'll unveil all the tools of the trade that meteorologists use to diagnose and predict the weather. 
we'll start by looking at a local company that has all sorts of tie-ins when it comes to weather technology. WeatherWatch's Megan Nielsen has more in our first installment of WeatherTech. For our first edition of WeatherTech, we didn't have to travel too far to find a true technology giant. Just an hour's drive from our WeatherWatch headquarters brought us to the outskirts of Philadelphia, where one of America's oldest and best-known weather technology companies calls home. This is Unisys. Unisys is known worldwide as a pioneer in technology and information services. However, the company also has its hands in the weather sector. Unisys Weather has been a leader in weather-related technology for over 60 years. They provide a number of products and services that meteorologists use to diagnose and predict the weather. These include everything from satellite and radar imagery to more advanced numerical models and atmospheric data sets. The company can be traced back to 1951 with the development of the UNIVAC-1, one of the nation's first supercomputers. Known most famously perhaps for correctly predicting the outcome of the 1952 presidential election, one of its many commercial uses was for numerical weather prediction. By the 1990s, Unisys was busy unveiling the next generation of weather radar, known today as NEXRAD. This radar network remains in operational use to this day and is a crucial tool for meteorologists when tracking everything from precipitation to severe weather. In the current day, Unisys has entered the mobile market with the Weather Enthusiast app for the iPhone and iPod Touch. The free handheld app gives its users access to a number of updated weather products, including radar imagery and current weather observations. Unisys also provides programs such as the Weather Processor, a weather visualization toolkit for near real-time and archived meteorological data. The software package handles data broadcast directly by the National Weather Service, analyzes the information, and finally visualizes the data in a variety of formats. Unisys also provides mission-critical public safety and operations data for NOAA and the FAA. Commercial airlines rely on the weather data and products that Unisys has to offer to help reduce risk, delays, and operating costs. The company also delivers unique products and services to the energy industry to help protect the national grid and other energy commodities. Thanks to Unisys, the private and public sectors both have access to an endless supply of important weather information. For this reason, Unisys remains a leader in all things weather tech. Reporting for WeatherWatch, this has been student meteorologist Megan Nielsen. Thanks, Megan. We're going to take a short commercial break but first, let's see how you do with this episode's Weather Trivia. Welcome back. Pennsylvania is home to a number of man-made structures None more stunning than the 300-foot Kinzu Bridge located in northwestern Pennsylvania. However, a severe storm in 2003 left the bridge in a pile of twisted rubble. Weather Watch's Megan Buzinovich has the story of the storm that reminds us the sheer power of Mother Nature that forever changed the local landscape. In the backwoods of northwestern Pennsylvania, there lies a landmark famous for being the tallest and longest bridge of its kind. But in 2003, it became famous for... Located in McKean County, Pennsylvania, the Kinzu Bridge, also known as the Kinzu Viaduct, has been dubbed an engineering masterpiece. The bridge was erected in 1882, in just 94 days, when General Thomas Kane decided that he needed to deliver coal to his customers across the valley. For generations, excursion trains brought visitors in from around the globe to witness the majestic bridge. The bridge was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1977 and was declared a historic civil engineering landmark in 1982. On July 21, 2003, a tornado touched down and headed straight for the bridge. The tornado caused 11 of the 20 bridge towers to collapse. An engineering masterpiece that had stood for over a century was destroyed in just a matter of 30 seconds. To learn more about the storm that spawned the tornado, we turn to meteorologist Rich Grum at the National Weather Service in State College. The system that created this particular tornado originated uh, from convection that had developed uh, actually the night before uh, over the Midwest. And the 
the mesoscale convective system developed a mesoscale convective vortice that came out of eastern Ohio and tracking to the north northeast that came over Pennsylvania and it triggered the instability in the warm moist air and it developed what we probably would call a mesoscale convective complex with this distinct vortex and the, the air was warm enough so the vortex worked to the surface and we had really strong surface winds almost like a hurricane over land if you will because of the really tight circulation at the surface. Tornadoes formed up in the northwest that came across McKean into Potter County. There actually was tornadoes, as you know, across uh, New York State. So this, this tight little vortex, this low-level source of vorticity, produced several uh, tornadoes uh, that afternoon. We spoke with park official Joe Palumbo in a recent visit to the Kinzu Bridge State Park to learn more about the significance of this bridge and the impact from the storm that brought it down. At one time, it was the highest, longest railroad viaduct in the whole world. I think that's amazing. It's sitting right here in our backyard. In 2003 when the tornado came there was workers uh, they were strengthening the bridge. Um, they had stopped the excursion trains. Uh, the bridge was kind of closed down. They were working on strengthening it. Uh, they kept tracking the storm and then uh, the workers had left for the day and the tornado came and the winds hit the bridge in three different directions. And what it actually did was it didn't blow the bridge over, but it lifted it, pulled the anchor bolts loose, and then it just crumbled down. One of the questions I've been asked the past couple years is when are people are going to be allowed to walk down under the bridge? Uh, we, we've had it closed off to visitors because of safety issues, so we didn't want people climbing on the steel that's laying there. Uh, afraid of them getting hurt. But the state has designed and come up with plans to put in a hiking trail that goes down below. Uh, we're in the process of, of putting that in now. It should be open sometime this year. Even though people have come to this bridge for its record-setting history, they still come to see the effects of a unique storm. For Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Megan Bezanovich. Thanks, Megan. Have you ever wondered what goes into making an episode of Weather Watch? Well, as we wrap up our third season of episodes, we're giving you all those details. Weather Watch's Gene Vivola has more as we go behind the scenes of Weather Watch. Scripts, cameras, editing, directing, and acting. It can be enough to make your head spin, but these terms aren't just found on a Hollywood backlot of next summer's hit blockbuster. They can be found right here, behind the scenes of Weather Watch. What started in 2012 as a weather news show has been transformed into its own brand of weather entertainment. As we conclude our third season, we decided to pull back the veil and show you what goes into making each episode of Weather Watch. To help us get a candid look at things, we've interviewed the producers of Weather Watch. Shane Brown has been a producer for three seasons and is the show's co-creator. Curtis Silverwood has been a producer since the second season and can be seen in a number of recurring segments throughout the show's history. According to the producers, the entire cast and crew get started weeks in advance to prepare for each and every episode. In the beginning of each semester, we have a list of ideas, and then we try to group those ideas together for a common theme. In past episodes, we had themes like severe weather outbreaks and climate. And each episode, we try to balance the fun with the facts. From here, we go out and get the story. Our travels have taken us to some unique locations, such as an empty amusement park or the inside of a Doppler radar. The idea is that weather affects and impacts us all. So no matter where we look, there's always a great weather story to tell. You know, one of the difficult things about putting a monthly weather show together is sometimes you have to just have things fall in your lap. There have to be weather events that happen that are interesting and impactful enough that you can make a story about it. I would have to say that the weather workshop is my favorite piece. I play Mr. Weather and my partner in crime, Jess Fink, she plays Haley Storm. And when we first thought of the piece, we were thinking back to our childhood, when we used to watch Bill Nye and the Magic School Bus, real fun, sciencey, and entertaining shows. So we wanted to, so Weather Watch wanted to aim for those younger audiences. Oh, what's my favorite segment? I'm, I'm probably going to have to go with, with Myth Breakers. I think Myth Breakers gives us a chance to not only tell a really great weather story, but also to have a lot of fun while we do it. And I, I think at the end of the day, we get a product that's funny, it's entertaining, Anyone can enjoy it, and you learn something. We, know, we like to say that we go beyond the forecast, and, and what that really means is we like to tell the stories. We like to sort of unveil this, this mystery and mystique behind meteorology, because there's a lot of stuff that people don't know. Back from the field, the attention turns toward editing. 
This is where the magic of TV takes place. Each scene is cut, cropped, moved, and polished into a smooth and flowing segment. The transition from raw footage to final product can be a long process, but as our producers say, it's all worth it in the end. Well, I think most people forget that we're students. But on top of that, we're meteorology majors, so our classes and tests are really hard. That's right, and for us, when we're putting together an episode, that can mean we have uh, some long nights editing, or maybe even some nights where we don't get that much sleep. But in the end, it's, it's a labor of love. It's all worth it. Once the segments are completed, the episode is wrapped up and put on the web for all of our viewers to see. But try as hard as we might, things don't always go as planned from start to finish. Sometimes we just have to sit back and laugh at ourselves. Lucky for you, we always keep the camera rolling. Wait, Vince. Hi. I love weather. <laughs> cool news. Mmm, chocolate. Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, mommy. Okay, mommy. Yeah. Girl check. Yeah, yeah. Right. Gotta do it every once in a while. Right? So glad you're here. <laughs> no, you're being so nice. Stop it. No. <laughs> uh, yep, yep. It's, it's definitely windy outside. I think I just had a stroke. Okay. <laughs> is, is everything straight? No. We're going to have to do that again. Now, let's fill the bottles up with the blue. Ugh. Hi, Mom. <laughs> I did it, right? I did good, right? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Gene. Well, that will do it for this episode and our third season of Weather Watch. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at the address as shown below. Check out our newly designed website, muweatherwatch.com, for our entire list of episodes. On behalf of the entire cast and crew, I'm Mike Yalch. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in September for an all new season.